So, do you hear me? Yes? Okay. Just trying to avoid the fun things at the start. Here we go. So, um, um, metrics are money, it's pretty, pretty explicit, right? And uh, that's kind of my day-to-day -day life. Um, well, it's supposed to work, and of course it doesn't. I can show you it was. That's great. What the hell? To click. I tried it. Should have worked. Hopefully. No. Well, the demo effect is there, at least. Oh, it's back. So I think it's my computer froze. That's not your yeah. hardware, thank you. So, well, before talking about that, uh, I'll, tell, I'll tell you who am I. Um, I'm a 40 years old nerd. Uh, I've been pushing buttons on the 64 since I was nine. <laughs> and uh, I fell into open source on uh, Slackware 3.1, source-based, in uh, 1996. Um, at, the, at the time, it was pretty rough to get anything working, really. And uh, after, uh, my first patch, I call it a hack more than, than a patch, uh, I've added my ISDN uh, card uh, in the PCI vendor list and um, all that stuff, and had to fix uh, just uh, tiny things. Um, <laughs> no, no, you don't have to do that. Uh, and I wrote also a few patches for, uh, or hacks, for Linux, Open Service, and FreeBSD kernels over the past 19 years. Um, none of those were a stream because I'm a lazy ass, and I just uh, didn't feel up to the task, to be frank. I'll come to the, uh, about it later. I've contributed a, a few patches, and here I mean a lot of patches, and of several Unity projects such as Prometheus, Metric Tank, CollegeD, many others, and a few TSDB engines. And I've been on call for 19 years. <laughs> so I've seen shit. Shit you, humans, you wouldn't believe. And uh, yes. So, and uh, I've been having work, working at CDZO.com for two and a half years, which will allow me to be there with you today. So. I'm pretty glad about that. So my life is very, pretty much this. And uh, you have things that are supposed to happen, and you have reality. So that's this. So ju just a tiny anecdote before I really start in. Um, a friend of mine just came on air and said, oh, well, congratulations on making it to KR conferences. I said, thanks. Well, I was looking at the speaker list, uh, so the usual leg legends, and you. <laughs> Good luck with that, seriously. He's not in the room, so. Um, this is not to be a public shaming session. I'm gonna talk about bugs, about consequences. I've, I've uh, taken out the names and the bugs voluntarily because it's not about that, really. It's how IT uh, world works. It's fine. I'm fine with it, and I love it, so no need for that. Uh, I, uh, I wrote this talk the, uh, the first time with a lot of technical things, with a lot of patches, uh, you know, all the usual stuff. And uh, then I realized that I would explain to you what the bugs are. You wrote the bugs, you wrote the fix. <laughs> so no, no sense to do that. Um, operations. So that's, that's been my life for 19 years, and uh, wh what wakes me up? Uh, 500 HTTP errors, non-zero shell return code, sec faults, kernel panic, ooms, that one, I love that, that cartoon, CRC errors, network problems, no data, no graph, and so on. Those are you, the usual suspects, you know those. You have metrics, you have alerting, you have tons of things that do, do the job for you. Problem is, when you sleep, there are st th sometimes the alarm thing doesn't work because you have a HTTP 200 error, yes. I've seen that a lot. Uh, failed shell script returning zero. Seg fault hidden by a process supervisor like Monit, Supervisor ID, or whatever, system DOS, I told it. Uh, silent data corruption, 
unknown states, such as the probe says, what's up? And it's like this forever, so you don't know. Uh, and it, it, there's no timeout, so you don't know about it. So it's stuck fine, but you should know it's stuck. Uh, pattern change. Uh, when the, you have that neat graph with lines that goes just up to the lowest threshold and down to the upper threshold, so everything is fine, right? But still, the pattern changed like a lot, and you don't see it. So we don't have that fancy stuff, you know, um, machine machine learning, you know, reentrant models, nice stuff like that. We don't have that thing in in ops for for now. Things are appearing, but it's not there yet. Um, not timeout and probe. I told it a bit earlier. And well, the list the list goes long. Those are still not the, f the cases I want to talk about, but those happened. Well, we all know that famous quote. It's debatable, but still, that's most uh, people uh, doing the management schools are, you know, fed their head with. What gets measured gets managed. It translates immediately into measure all things, which is usually a good thing. The problem is um, that's currently our dashboard for my company. Uh, we have like a thousand servers and uh, two dot five petabytes of data, or something like that. And that's the most compact view we could have of the infrastructure. To just to show that graph, you have to pull uh, like thousands of time series to get that aggregated. Um, and you know, pull in that way. Um, you know, <laughs> I have these uh, obsessions. When something doesn't work fine or great, I used to oh, this, this tiny thing. I have to fix it. You know, I'm not the kind of guy that looks to the ground and fix what's there, not the moon. And yes, so that's basically my life. And um, just to make make it more, you know, meaningful, just a sense of a sense of, of scale. At the, I was at the Prometheus Con in Google uh, last year, and uh, there were pretty interesting numbers. The first one was Fastly with more than 100 Prometheus servers, 28.4 million time series, 2.2 million samples per second, so data points. Uh, Claude Ferrer didn't give the older specifics, but 267 Prometheus servers. Uber has gone you know, insane. 400 to 600 million data points per second pre aggregation. 30 billion data points. That's a lot. And you've heard of cogni cognitive load, I, think, I suppose. If you're developing, you know about that. That's, you know. Simple truth. And those guys, I have to deal with the code you produced. You and the business guys produce. And metrics is, is among the, the things that are filling your brain. What if even the most metrics weren't what we thought they'd be? What if the same metric did not mean the same from server to another? What if we were all wrong most part of the time? That's actually what's happening in SRE or operations or system in one world, whatever you call it. So we're often like this, like you. And this talk really starts now. Um, a few real uh, real life stories. Those stories I've been involved in. It's not a hearsay, it's something I've been acting in. So those numbers are true. <laughs> I was there. <laughs> So, just a simple thing, just before that, yes, top. I've played a game with uh, me to senior ops guys. I mean, like, the, the real stuff, the guys that know their shit, right? Those guys, two out of ten were almost correct about what the load is. Fun, fun uh, quote from Brendan Gregg, load averages are an industry critical metric. My company spends millions of scaling cloud instances on them and other metrics. But on, the, on Linux, there's some mystery around them. Brendan Gregg. After all, it only took 12 screens, like in, on my laptop, to Brendan Gregg to explain Linux load average history. 
Quite simple, right? Oh, and good news. These computers are different than other kernel OSs. You know, the, the ininterruptible IO thing, and probably other things, but that's the biggest one. So, uh, a, real, a real story. Network packets. Um, where am I? Oh, I'm a bit fast. Um, I have this friend named Fu. His name has been, you know, scratched, but here is Fu. He's hired in a, in a brand new company. He replaced a dying homemade Linux based switch with a very common one in a lab. So, no th nothing really protocritical. So, no problem, he does that. He adds metrics to the brand new switch and figures out something is wrong, like really wrong. Switch and server are absolutely not giving the same results. At least 50% drop on all network TX or uh, packet discount during the usual benchmarks. And he examines the dashboard, and there was, you know, an axe in the formula, which was, you know, stripping um, uh, all the, um, let's say that, you know, the, the, the well, you got it, <laughs> all the, that, and uh, that was just an aggravating factor, but it wasn't the root cause, and uh, the problem was still the same. So it caught me on RSC. Uh, I've just had released a few patches in, uh, in CollectD. And say, well, if anyone's there, Bjorn, you know CollectD full, right? Oops, just lost my right, my left eye. Nope. It's OK, one eye left. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't on the purpose. <laughs> so, I've had to read the collected code, which, which, which was pretty straightforward. It's pure C. It's, uh, I've committed in, in that project, so I kind of knew it already. So it took me time uh, to read it, but not that much. Collected was reading data from Procnet Dev. Nobody magic, really pretty straight. And, oops, sorry, yeah. Uh, no, nope. I went too far. Yes, sorry. It appeared that the server uh, connected to the switch and the Linux-based old switch were running the exact same old Linux kernel version. But not only those ones. Also, all, all the servers and computers involved uh, in the benchmarking thing. So all the lab. Stupid idea, but that was there. And those couldn't be upgraded because of some proprietary drivers and specific components that couldn't be upgraded because of some whatever reason I, I didn't know. And so we had a look at Procnet Dev. Well, at least we tried. Um, when this happens, the documentation for Procnet Dev was, you know, not great. Uh, gladly, there was this old mail from 2007 from a Red Hat mailing list that gave some useful hints. Uh, much of this is only well documented in the code. Here's an attempt at interpreting softnet stat. No guarantee that it is correct. Read the code. <laughs> and there might be some double counting going on. So at, at this particular point, you're really reinsured. You know everything's going to be OK. So that's how we sysadmin see the kernel. <laughs> I'm, I'm not cheating you. It's exactly like this. And I've, I've played with git logs. That's just for the IGB driver. If you do the same for stats or any component, you, you have that fun. So if you look at those commits separately, and I did, um, some are the, the, the short commit doesn't, uh, you know, isn't nice with what's happening really, because the detail com the, the detailed description uh, shows that it's more complicated than just that. But the first reaction you have when you're sysadmin, you're afraid, you're frightened, you want to cry loud. <laughs> and of course, you read the code as you, you're being told, and you get there. So that's in the UDP.c. Uh, some really an anonymous guy uh, committed it like 12 years ago. Um, 
the comment itself makes sense. But if you are, you know, in the scared mood, it's more frightening. But there's a, uh, a reporting in above might not be good. So might. But otherwise, we don't have a good statistic, or better. We could add another new stat, but at least for now, that seems like overkill, maybe. The thing is, it pretty makes sense if you take the time to understand what he meant. But I just want to make you understand the state you, the state you are in when you read this. I know you will do all your best, and I'm not criticizing anything. I'm just saying facts and what's happening. I know it's hard to write good comments. I, I'm unable to do that, so I understand. And what I had to do uh, uh, was uh, to read uh, 1,200 pages, long manufacturer tech document, to understand what the features were in the, in the card, network card, and uh, a few other things. You know, GRO, GSO, RPS, RFS, whatever, uh, many things. Uh, all of those hacks and features were, are pretty amazing, but still, that's many things to, to process if you don't know how it works. So it took quite a lot of time. And one of the, 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 the biggest, the, the thing that shocked me, and it's absolutely normal, but I didn't realize it, uh, was the tons of code paths that you can go inside the same driver. The same driver can have like hundreds of thousands of different code paths for different cards. So a different card really means something different, even if you have the same driver. CCTL entries, I could try to list those, but we could stay like a few days. Uh, we're talking about thousands of CCTL entries. Um, well, documentation was not what it was today, but those kind of situations when you are in an area that needs you know, help uh, are pretty common, even nowadays. So to sum it up, I've just had, we, we've just had to notice the problem, fix the graph configuration, start reading the user and start collecting software, there's one missing word, uh, realize and make sure the bug was not there before you know, reading the, the spooky kernel driver code, and realize the bug is really in the code path that ProcNet dev hits, Read the 1,200 pages text specs from the manufacturer to make sure that's really not I think nothing else. Find a few related patches. Luckily, the kernel was, was old and the, the problems were already fixed. But still, we couldn't change the, the kernel, so we had to backport the fixes. We rebuilt the, the kernel driver only four times. We were lucky because uh, when I tried the other hacks, it took me like really bigger number data than that. And we just redid the whole production for weeks. And that was just to read valid TX, RX, packets, counters. <laughs> Last year, uh, based on this metric, they, they doubled network capacity for more than 2.8 million euros. <laughs> that's the pinning point. And that's a, an absolutely true story. So that's the first time when I, when, uh, I made a joke, the guy was like, white. Uh, he was black, but he became white. <laughs> and I said, SRE should not be spelled sorry. So that's what happened. Um, I have other fun stories. Resellers and manufacturers. So we had many servers of a validated type because, you know, we're you know, seniors, we know, we know our shit, we know what, what to do, we have to valid validate things, benchmark, make sure everything is okay. And um, those had 10 gigabytes AXB NIX, nothing unusual. According to capacity planning, we ordered a 240 servers batch, not the lowest one, you know, the, the virtualization nodes with big RAM, big CPUs, big, all big stuff. And Linux TCP IP network statistics are bad. We get like retransmits a lot and latencies and all the nasty stuff. The new switch metrics were green. Well. And Linux did not have single related statistics for FiberNix at the time. So uh, we tried another brand and model of SFP Plus, and it worked just fine. So obviously, it was the SFP Plus. So we just contact the reseller. Everything is fine. Well, if only we've had those SFP Plus 
registers in kernel ETH store. I told that in the open space where I was working. My CTO just replied, you have 10 full days to prove them wrong. Uh, I'm the network stack we're talking about, and I'm no real kernel dev. <laughs> That's why you have 10 full days to prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolutely true story. I read everything I could. I could find about the optical signal, uh, SFP plus, and DOM statistics. I've tried to find something like an RFC. Uh, well, that was the text specs, and I was no, you know, not really introduced to that kind of things before. It's been violent. And I found a micro project named Bifrost, doing just what I want uh, with the 2.6 kernel. The Apache were never pushed off string, of course. And we needed to run on Twitter 4 because of uh, virtualization features and uh, hardware compa compatibility. Sorry. We emailed the guys about the, the 3.4 patch. No luck. They replied like, ha, good luck. <laughs> so I said, let's part this. You know, I'm obsessed. Uh, yes, I told you. And the good news was there were pretty big, uh, big changes between 2.6 and 3.x. Uh, on the particular part, and uh, I ended up rewriting the patch set. Kernel and ETH tool entirely in five days. And honestly, it wasn't that hard. I I'll talk about that later. Patch worked in position for three or four years without a glitch. So that's the result. It's not the good way, but it worked. And I tried to send my patch to someone doing things in the kernel. That's what I got back. <laughs> And I say, so what should I fix? And <laughs> my education forbids me to tell you what happened after. <laughs> after adding the ATH tool output and the patch set into the resource case, he agreed to change the incompatible CFP plus after only five days of hard work. So 480 brand new SFP plus arrived. We changed the faulty SFP plus for weeks. And that was it. So we roughly you know, saved like 200k euros uh, just because I've added a patch. So metrics are money, right? Discs. Uh, I was working in a hosting company, the same one that the previous one. And we built ZFS-based SAN NAS. Uh, the production use itself was using open source kernels because of ZFS at the time. And um, all the hardware integration was done on Linux. We wrote a, a PXE system that was booted up on every new machine that was auto-configuring, auto-upgrading, auto-whatever, the hardware. And uh, it was doing all the, the, the work for us. So um, logically, uh, we worked on Linux to prove the uh, hardware uh, reseller uh, the pro where the problem was. Uh, I'm going to talk about the problem right after that. And, well, my coworker just says, well, we have serious uh, storage performance issues in the low. Let's dig it. So this had the same labels, same text specs, for real, like to the, to the digit, to the digit, but not exactly the same physical look. <laughs> Things we didn't see because disks were in the, the, the racks, so no problem. And when you do an inquiry <laughs> query, <laughs> there was this, which was quite surprising. Remember, it was validated and pretty solid order. Um, so it is not the same brand this model. Uh, we do not guarantee anything else than tech specs. So meaning the brand is up to, uh, to, up to them. Uh, I cut the crap, but please do something. Oops, there's a bug. Uh, after ex extensive profiling, uh, we were able to produce the programmatic workload. So, as you can see, performances were like cut in half, uh, to say the very least, more like 60%. More like so, your know, service time is just to the roof. Uh, average weight is the, like unbearable. And the throughput, wow. <coughs> Not good. I hope. Um, it happened to be this 
specific workload was to happen to be the one that ZFS used the most in the, all the tunings we've done. So we call the manufacturer again. Uh, our test should show that the disks you have sent are fine. We're pretty happy about that. <laughs> but we kind of get used to it. Uh, except they are not. And see the IOSTAT output. And we waited for one week. Then you have locally smart CTL, more metrics, more metrics, <laughs> more metrics. <laughs> so that's a bunch of metrics. Um, it's kind of the same problem that we've had with the network NICs. If you don't know what all those capitalized words are, you have a tiny problem. Um, at the same time, when we say, yes, it's not OK, the, the letters in the dark for a week, um, I've had this really spectacular email sending us a fixed firmware, but a beta one that I shouldn't you know, distribute in the A, blah, blah, blah. So you know, I'm an old timer. And uh, when I saw that the performance was, performances were even better than, than the good this, I said, whoa, that's not normal. So I do a stupid thing, binary diff between the dumped firmware and the firmware the, the sent. There was just one bit change. <laughs> yes, a Boolean. <laughs> well, they just silently enabled write cache without battery units in the storage <laughs> thing, which is like very bad. If power goes out, you just lose the data. So it's dangerous. Uh, we proved the disks did not have the same behavior specs using this diff, this one. Which, which <laughs> it was a silly idea, but it worked. Uh, I took the, the smart CTL outputs, I used diff on it, you know, make a bit of magic to make the lines align and, and stuff like this, because from time to time, since the, the manufacturers were different, the order uh, could vary. So with a bit of magic, we, we saw a lot of things. And we saw that the behavior itself was not the same. The tech specs weren't the same. So their mo uh, motto, 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 wasn't, you know, OK. So they agreed to change the 250 disks for uh, a net worth of 150k euros. So we spent the next month. My brother here did that. I don't know where it is. Yeah. He changed disk by disk, array by array, all the disks resolving, resolving disk in production without crashing anything. So it took us like weeks. Uh, when I say weeks, it's months, yes. Well, uh, well I'm a bit ahead. Um, what you've got to remember about, about this, I, I could go on for hours, literally. Those are the, more, the, the funniest story I uh, have in store, but I have the others. Metrics are everywhere in operations at an unprecedented scale and still growing fast. In my little career, I've started small, and the more machines I have to handle, the more these cases are happening often. And whenever you're uh, you, you see problems, you understand that most of the IT professionals do, do not understand fully what they are currently graphing. They, do, they don't have the slightest idea of what's really going on. And to tell you the truth, I think I'm, uh, 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 I don't too. Even with all the work I've done. Because they're always the, the black box with the hardware, the firmware, or the thing you don't know about. So you know things, you can reduce the margin of error, but you cannot be 100% sure. Never, ever. So keep that in mind. It's really important, especially in prediction. Graphs are not meant to trigger a deeper questioning. Uh, are meant, sorry. Graphs are meant to trigger a deeper questioning when the behavior changes. It's not about you know, the specific number that is to the, to the, to the digit. It's, it's, you have to have a, a, a gist, a gist um, you know, an, an idea of what's going on. It, it has to you know, alert you that something is, going, is wrong. But you really have to go down the, the, the whole process I described earlier. If 
especially if you want to make a costly decision based on metrics, such as you know, capacity planning or those kind of things. Because, yes, I forgot to give an example which, which was written. The load. Many cloud-based companies are basing auto-scaling on load, not solely, but most part of the time. And the more the Kubernetes and all the cloud thing is you know, over the place, uh, the more you see like big, big, big bills coming in just because the load went nuts because of an NFS mount. That's something like that. So, base costly decision based on metrics is pure folly. You have to, you know, confront code reality, push the things, try try things with different versions. And I do mean it. I, it's it's really, 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 really costly. You spend m many hours doing this, days, weeks, if, even if you have to. But when millions are, you know at stake, you have to do that. And many, many people don't just say, no, we just ordered like 500 of those before. They're fine. No, trust me, test those. Uh, just, I told you I would come back about my, con my personal kernel experience. Um, those are the notes I would send to my young me. Kernel code ain't no send writing. It's code, right? And you know what? I've been coming at Kernel Recipes for like seven years, something like that. I just, I was just feeling unworthy. I know it's stupid now, but I had the, you know, the imposter syndrome. I've been living proof that it exists. And the thing is, you don't dare to even look at the code. And that's the biggest issue that you have between the potential L user kernel hacker like me and what we call legends or whatever you want, you. People have to understand that you're just normal people and I understood that by coming here, talking to you. Stephen like almost hit me when I told, you, told him about the, the patch of Treasure Upstream. And he was right, actually. One thing I understood very quickly, macros are your friend. If you don't know how to write proper C, which is my case, use macros. <laughs> In fact, you don't do C when you do kernel code. You do macros. Read the GIST history per subsystem. It helps a lot to understand in what mindset things are done. Um, I think it's, it's one of the, the best advice I could give not for the kernel only, but in software development in general. If you have, if you want to propose a new feature or whatever you want to, to propose, understand why things are the way they are before actually making any changes. You will probably be wrong at first. And that's absolutely normal. It's ego crushing, but that's normal. Ask upstream if they are interested in what you want to, what you plan to write. It saves a lot of time, a lot of, of frustration, and a lot of, you know, uh, how to say that? Name calling? Propose a way of doing things, expose your vision, you know you'll be crushed, but do it. Then code and get things up to it, really. That's the best advice I should have had before. Um, that's it. Any questions? Yes. Sorry? Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Excuse me. Is this on? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's not a question, it's a comment. Congratulations, you're a legend. <laughs> yourself a collector of technical debt? <laughs> sorry? sorry? <laughs> you, it seems to me that you are from the 
mafia and you are collecting the technical debt <laughs> others in your chain uh, supply chain have ignored or conveniently uh, Le legacy is our life you know uh, when you write code it's already legacy that's what I, I tell as a joke to our developers so well, for me it's more than legacy when you receive artists which are labeled and it's not what is inside the box someone else was making money yes. so creating a technical debt which was much more than yeah, he, he gained know. But in small companies, there are realities. I understand what you say, and I do agree. The thing is, sometimes in ops, first you fix, then you think. <laughs> and it's actually that. You have to fix things quickly. Sometimes it's nasty. But you do, you do it first, and then you try to, help to avoid those, uh, those, those things to come back. But do you think it, the, your supply chain, whether it's <laughs> hardware or code, will will be fixed any time or will be improved at least? The, the problem with the supply chain, it it's, already, it's really related to the costs. Uh, we took that particular supplier because it was cheap and good. And if you, when scale comes in, you have to have the integration team. That's normal, right? All the big ones have that. When you are a small or a mid-sized uh, company, which we're, we're in the in there, um, it's more debatable, more debatable because those cases happen like once a year, twice, not much more. So having those people, a people that does that, are costing a lot. Um, you know, uh, it's the, the, the in-between state that is uh, difficult to address. The big ones, no problem. They, they handle that pretty good. The, the small ones, they just don't. Or sometimes they pay the, a bit more to, do, to, uh, to get a better reseller. And uh, even the good resellers are prone to these kind of problems. So I don't see any you know, evident solution. The, the real problem here was picking hardware without support for a long time, uh, prop proprietary drivers. Those are the, the, the bad choices, but I was just helping a guy. Um, on the company where I uh, work, Usually, I tend to push in the full open source direction. One of the biggest issues we have here is the open hardware thing. It's not pushed enough, and we would need that more. <laughs> I have one eye. <laughs> Um, as uh, I think we are quite kind of lot of sysadmin, SRE, uh, performance DevOps, whatever you call that, uh, in this room, and you also have the other side, like all the uh, developer, the kernel developers, the experts in their fields. Uh, I, when I have to talk on the different subject or subsystems or stuff like that, uh, we are um, as SRE, we are mostly. Uh, on the, the crossway, we are we have to manage all the servers, deploy in prod, uh, handle them, all the bugs, stuff like that. And sometimes we see, I, I, think, I don't know if you share the, the idea, but uh, we we have okay, why this guy did develop this feature as this one? Maybe he has a different view. Maybe he's developing uh, as Linux is very uh, working on kind of uh, workloads. So it works on IoT, on servers, on desktops, on uh, HPC. You have a lot of different uh, versions. I don't know if uh, the people that do the implementation, so developers, you, uh, if you know, if you have some feedback from the users that they are running at scale. I don't know if it is something that is already done in the kernel. So do you have an idea if we can, us as sysadmin? Uh, or performance stuff, stuff like that, provide this feedback to the developers community? I'm no one like this, so... <laughs> what, what, do, do those guys? Uh, it's almost the same question. I was suggesting that uh, since you consider that uh, you are not a legend and there are many legends in the room, mm. uh, 
what would you ask uh, these people to improve uh, so that they make your, uh, your life at work easier? For example, we have been discussing about uh, stable versus unstable ABI or API, but it seems like uh, in your case, the metrics, uh, everything that is reported is almost as important as an ABI mm. because after all, it's something visible from the end user. Mm. So maybe you have some, uh, some advices or some, some requests to formulate on this. That ad adding a bad metric to me is worse than, than having no metric. That's the first thing. Uh, I know it's the one of the biggest problems of IT, but naming things is of the essence. And uh, usually uh, I'm the first uh, culprit, but uh, you have to find a good name for your thing. And we tend, uh, as developers, yeah, include me now, uh, we, we tend to have a subjective way of naming things um, according to what we were working at the time. So it was very funny because during the Stephen talk earlier, he talked about the IP address. It was an in instruction pointer, and we, we, you know that if you've done ASM a bit, but if you, did, you didn't, it, it's V4. So that's quite the same shit going on. And usually you get confused, especially when you're not sure of anything. It's a, you know, a topic you don't, you don't master. So that's normal. So doing that is pretty important. And uh, th th there's one good practice that the Prometheus exporters are doing is for every single metric, you export an help field, just a simple description. Um, I think FreeBSD does that, uh, CCTL uh, does uh, dash something, and you get the information in the exact definition of the CCTL. <laughs> so. <laughs> um, I think that kind of thing might help a lot. And you know, be more specific. Add a, a help uh, something in the CCTL, or maybe it's there. I don't know. I stop. I stop looking for it. But that's something that would help a lot. Th that's interesting because um, you gave the example of a Procnet dev, which was uh, reporting uh, wrong uh, values or, or incorrect. I don't yeah. know. Uh, I've been hit by this uh, in the past mm. uh, when using LRO. Uh, mm. because uh, it was counting only aggregated uh, packets. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, sometimes it's interesting to see uh, just what is being processed by the system because you want to have these metrics. Mm. And sometimes you prefer to have the equivalent packet of uh, what you have on the, on the wire. Yes, but, but with a single metric, you can't return two, in mm. two information. A and you, st you still have to know what LRO is. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the starting point. I, we're there. You remember the, 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 the plane? Uh, cartoon, mm. that's the, the, the reality. Most, mm. most ops guys are thinking kind of like this. So having a little help somewhere, just, you know, just a description field somewhere, I don't know where or how, it would change everything. Okay. Doesn't the kernel have like a documentation directory which is just being yeah. rewritten in Rust? When it's three in the morning, uh, when it's three in the morning and everything around you is on fire, you have the time to read the kernel documentation or the kernel code. Uh, I'm, I'm making, you know, I'm being sarcastic, but the, the, I agree with you. Documentation is there, but at the time where I've had these stories, not so great. So some sort of thirst documentation would be uh, helpful? Yes, Docu docu documentation is always helpful, whatever you say. Yes, but you have yeah a, a digest maybe. Okay. The, the the developer view is very important, and without that, I wouldn't have done anything like this. But the the best thing um, is to sum it and make it simpler for simple minds. It's important. Less places to look at. Yes, ju just like a, sh a schema, a tr uh, something weird, a, sch a schema of the network stack. <laughs> something unreal. I know a friend of uh, mine has started to do that project. I think it didn't finish because it's a huge word. It's very complicated. It's, it's, to me, it's something that should be there. Every subsystem should have a schema before doing or writing anything else. But I know it's moving. There. And just to add something, it's funny because uh, I'm not a kernel guy, as, as I say. 
I used to work in uh, in companies where microservices are, you know, the the fashion thing to do. And um, they have the same problem because you deploy a lot of t of code and you lose the the links between those. And the mapping thing is a problem. So for, for instance, we're developing a, a, a system that is gathering all those things. Every every um, every comp microservice declares itself t uh, in, a, in, a, in a hook and gives uh, a root and a st metadata and stuff like this. And it's exposed uh, for every single microservice. Then it's gathered, uh, it's registered into console, which is a service reg registration service. And then we gather all those things, we, we build a graph, we historize this, and now we're writing, it's in the process, a web UI that uh, generates uh, visual uh, maps of the microservices. You have the core graph, you have many things for the kernel, but it's not really easy for a newcomer. So it's always the same problem. It's uh, depend on the scope and the scale. Sorry. Question. Yes. You should you should have started reading kernel code uh, roughly in 1991. That was. <laughs> <laughs> so now, no, but what what I really wanted to say, and as an answer uh, to that question over there, what can people like sysadmins, DevOps, and whatever do uh, to improve the situation? If you ever encounter something which is badly documented, wrongly documented, or not at all documented, send a patch. And even if it's completely wrong, it doesn't matter. People will look at it and will say, okay, yeah, you, yes. that's your interpretation, but it's just not the reality. But then we actually can fix the documentation or add documentation. I, I, I am totally agreeing with you. It's, it's not my, what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, at the time, I felt like I was unable to, I was unworthy of, that's at the time. Now I know it's different. Right. Th and the thing is, I know uh, sending even bad things makes people think, and that's the point, and change things, and fix things. Um, I would do that now. I'm just not into kernel things nowadays. That's it. Right. And right. I used perf and the kernel code to know what's wrong in my system, or why I'm losing performances, uh, say, uh, because they, the keep alive is broken and you, you open like thousands of uh, connections instead of four or some stuff like that. But I'm not doing that kind of stuff anymore. But if I were to do that again, I would. Yeah. And don't be scared about sending crap. <laughs> we all started that way. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all.